Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Loretta Young, George Brent, and Mary Oster in The Great Lie. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Great stars are born, not made. But like the mechanic and the carpenter, they too must learn their trade. Loretta Young played her first part when she was four years old. George Brent started to learn about acting at 18. Mary Astor began her picture career at the mature age of 14. And a few days ago, while our play was in rehearsal, Miss Astor won the Academy Award for the finest performance by a supporting actress during the past year. That winning performance on the screen was in the same part she plays tonight on the air. I like to work with people who have records like that. I like to produce radio plays and make pictures with them. Just give a trio of stars like these three a play like The Great Lie, and it's a joy to watch the finished production take form and assume reality. Tonight's drama is adapted from the Warner Brothers picture, a story that cuts to the heart of a very human situation. Two women in love with the same man. Disaster hangs over the head of one woman. The other holds the strings that can bring it down upon her rival with a crash. It's the eternal triangle, but a brand new design. One that brought picture audiences trooping to the theaters to see the great lie. You know, there's something more to making pictures than the artistic side. There's also the all-important business side. And I think one of the finest compliments ever paid to Lux Flakes is that it plays the same role for leading Hollywood studios as it does for you in your home. I was one of Lux's best customers when we were filming Reap the Wild Wind, which involved hundreds of picturesque old southern costumes. Any wardrobe man can tell you how much money our product saves him annually in prolonging the life and color values of washable costumes, especially when the picture is in technicolor. <laughs> and in these exciting days, a housewife must be a combination purchasing agent, cost accountant, and office manager. So it's not surprising that these domestic executives reach the same conclusion as our studio executives. In two well-chosen words, Lux Flakes. And one word curtain begins our play. Here's the first act of The Great Lie, starring Loretta Young as Maggie, George Brent as Pete, and Mary Astor as Sandra. Fowler! Fowler! What is it? That's Mr. Pete up there, flying down from the sky like an angel of the Lord. Oh, hush your mouth. He ain't no angel, and he ain't coming to this house no more. That Mr. Pete devil's on his honeymoon. Out of the blue Maryland sky... An airplane drops to the pasture land beside a rambling old colonial master mansion. A man vaults quickly from the cockpit and strides across the field toward the house. He swings over the garden fence and stands looking up toward a window on the second floor. Maggie! Ain't no use whistling around here, Mr. Pete. That sound belongs in the day that is gone. Hello, Violet. Miss Maggie in her room? Mr. Pete, if you take my advice, you'll get right back in that airplane and fly away like a bird, right back where you come from. Go tell her I'm here, will you? No, sir, Mr. Pete. She ain't wanting to see you no more. We done read the newspapers about you running off and getting married. Now, Violet, you know you can't read. Well, Miss Maggie can. Violet! Maggie, I'm coming up. Your name ain't Violet, Mr. Pete. You stay right down here where you belong. I'm coming, Miss Maggie. Come in, Violet. Is that Mr. Pete down there? Yes, ma'am. Is he drinking? Well, what do you care if he's drinking or if he ain't? Well, tell him I'm busy and uh, I've got a cold. Hey, did you take your medicine? Yes, not much better. I don't want to see him anyway. Well, that's what I told him. But I'll tell him again. Now, you go down and be nice and polite and, and tell him I've got a cold and that I'm busy and that I... Oh, I can't see him, can I, Violet? No, Miss Maggie, you sure can't. Why not, Maggie? Pete. Mr. Pete, you get yourself downstairs. Don't let him in here, Miss Maggie. It's all right, Violet. Leave us alone. Yeah. But it ain't good, Miss Maggie. Well, what's the matter with you? What's the matter with me? Oh, you've got a cold. Yes. What are you taking for it? None of your business. Well, how'd you get it? I got wet. Mm-hmm. 
I always said you didn't have sense enough to come in out of the rain. If I had any sense, if I'd had any sense I wouldn't be in your life. No, you wouldn't. Just like this cold. A sneeze or two and you'd be gone. Your nose is pink and your eyes are red. And violets are blue and sugar is sweet and I wish you'd go. What are you doing down here anyway? I want to talk to you. You want to talk to me? You act as if nothing had happened. You haven't forgotten you're married, have you? No. Well, I'm sure Sandra hasn't. Well, it was very sudden, the whole thing. Yeah, so the paper said. Peter Van Allen marries famous concert pianist. Couple fly from New York to South Carolina. Well, you must have passed right over the house here, Pete. Why didn't you drop me a dope? Well, Maggie, uh, that's what I want to talk about. Uh, I think I want to hear about it. Oh, Maggie. Now, please. All right. Is there anything else? Well, among other things, I, uh, I'm thinking about going back into aviation. There's a lot doing now. Hemisphere defense, you know, and all that sort of thing. Whose idea is this? Yours, don't you remember? The day after New Year's. There was snow, and we skated. And I proposed. And I refused. Yeah. Oh, Pete, let's not go into this thing all over again. I'm not whining, but it's been like this for four years. On and off and off and on. And Well, there was only one thing I ever asked you. One thing I begged you to do. To be a sober, solid citizen. Well, sober anyway. But I guess the prospect was too dull for you. Well, it's all over now, and I feel just the way I did when they took the bands off my teeth. I had those blasted things for four years, too. Yeah, I know. Tell me honestly, Pete. Is this marriage of yours going to help? If I thought it would, I'd be completely for it. Well, you know Sandra. Yes, I do. Like her? I hate her. Oh, not because she's married to you, Pete, but... Oh, you know... Well, I won't talk about it. The fact remains that whatever she was or is, she's your wife and I can't discuss it. Well, Maggie, let me tell you something. Violet was right. You shouldn't have come here and I shouldn't have seen you. Every time I do, I feel like your little gray-haired old mother with the roses over the door, the lamp at the window. Well, the lamp is out. That's not true. Anyway, I'm tired of being your... your haven. Did your wife know you came down here? No. Don't you think it would have been nicer if you'd have told her? Yeah, yes, but she was asleep. Besides, I wanted some fresh air, and I wanted to talk to you about something. Aviation. That was only part of it. Maggie, listen, after all, we all make mistakes. Have you come down here behind her back in the first week to tell me you've blundered? Oh, Maggie, let's... Come let... in. Excuse me, but it's time for your medicine, Miss Maggie. Now, Violet, please. Mr. Pete, ain't it time you was gone? Your lady wife must be waiting for you by now. Now, Violet, I'm sure your intentions are of the best, but this is a very personal well, matter. Well, there ain't nothing personal between Miss Maggie that ain't personal with me. Since she is that big, I done took care of her. Now, Violet, but Pete, you better go. Maybe I'd better. Goodbye. Goodbye. Sorry, Violet. Why, Violet. I'm sorry, Miss Maggie. I'm sorry for him, and I'm sorry for you, and I... Oh, Violet, please don't. Please don't, Listen, that's her latest recording. She plays like a man. Look, do you think I could go in and see her? Certainly not. She's listening. She doesn't want to be disturbed yes, now. Yes, but uh, I'm her husband. And I'm her manager. No. All right, all right. That's what I get for marrying a genius. Madame Kovac is a genius. Turn that thing off. It's horrible. Josh, that record's horrible. Sandra. We'll have to do it over again. That second side is the worst thing I've ever listened to. Hello, darling. Oh, hello. But, Sandra, it sounded wonderful. Don't argue, Josh. Now run along. Do I get a kiss, darling, or don't I? Sandra, I've got to speak to you. Uh, what about the concert Tuesday? How are you going to do it? Of course I am. Now get out. Good. I'll call Hamlin for it. Hello, Pete. Uh, you have said that. Where were you all day? You didn't even call. Oh, I went down to see my good lawyer, Jock, and then I, uh, I flew down to Maryland. Maryland? Whatever for? Fresh air. Did you get it? What? The air. Oh, Pete, you've got to be patient with me. I've been a bachelor so long. You know, one of the most attractive things about you to me has always been that you understood women. Now, you're going to try to understand me, aren't you? Uh, look, Sandra, I wonder if you could ease up on this hectic life of yours. You know, come away someplace quietly, some golf and some walks and some fresh air. Me? <laughs> oh, Pete, this is a side of you I've never seen. And by the way, I haven't told you. We'll have to do it again. What? Get married. Are you kidding? No, I'll have to propose and you'll have to say yes and then we can be married again. That's what my lawyer wanted to see me about today. But I don't see what was wrong. Well, it seems your divorce from Mr. Stokes won't be final until next Tuesday. Oh, that's ridiculous. It was final when I married you. I'm afraid you're wrong. The decree can't be entered until next Tuesday. You had your dates mixed. Dates bore me. 
Oh, then we're not actually married. That's it. <laughs> Did you tell someone in Maryland all this? She must have been very amused. And if there's one thing I adore, it's being laughed at, and by a woman. Of course I haven't told anyone. Well, are you going to propose to me again? Well, I think we should sit down and talk this thing out and see where we're going. Then we can be married again next Tuesday. I'll be at playing in Philadelphia Tuesday. Put it off. Pete, is there a doubt in your mind that we could make a go of this? Well, I'm asking you to marry me again. You were much more amusing the first time. Uh, well, I'm sober now. Well, suppose you go out and get yourself into another mood. All right. Good night, Sandra. Pete, when are you coming back? Next Tuesday. I'll be in Philadelphia. Look, Sandra. That's the day we're going to be married. I've already told you I won't be here. Then don't go to Philadelphia. Pete, darling, please try to understand. Marriage or no marriage, I'm doing a concert in Philadelphia. Maggie, were you out front? No, I just got in at 10.15. Where's Pete, Sandra? In New York. Oh, did you come to see him? I came to see you both. I thought he'd be here naturally. How did you know I was playing here? I called your apartment in New York. Was Pete there? No. Oh. Cigarette? Oh, no, thanks. Phew, I'm hot. Well, don't catch cold. I'm just over one. Pete left the window open the other morning while I was still in bed, and I caught cold in my shoulder. I'm sure he did it on purpose. One thing, there's never a dull moment with Pete. Tell me, did you find him stubborn? When? Well, you were engaged to him twice, weren't you? Yes. You're looking very well under the circumstances. What circumstances? You said you had a cold. Oh, yes. But I said I was over it. The cold? Definitely. Good for you. Now, what do you want me to tell Pete? Well, it's an idea I've had for him for a long time. Well, if you want to write it, I promise not to open the letter if you'll mark it personal from Maggie. I went to Washington to see my Uncle Ted after Pete told me he was going to offer himself to the government. Whatever for? Income tax? Aviation. Didn't he tell you his plan? Not about flying for the government, no. I'm going to keep Pete on the ground. Pete's an expert of maps and navigation. And that, coupled with his flying, makes him just the kind of man the government's going to need. Uncle Ted said all he'd have to do would be to apply for a job. Well, it's very kind of you, Maggie. But I like Pete where he is and as he is. Well, he's your husband. Yes. Now, suppose you go. It was just a thought, Sandra. Oh, and a very sweet one. If I didn't think you meant so well, I'd feel like slapping your face. <laughs> On that one point, Sandra, we deeply understand each other. Well, I guess I can go home now. Yes. Don't miss your little train, Maggie. Good night. You certainly have a nerve, Pete. Now, hold your horse. I will not. This is not a roadhouse that you can drop in and out of whenever you happen to be passing. I don't want you here. Go back to your oh, wife. don't be a fool. And don't touch now, me, Now, let's please. not have a brawl. At least you might have the good manners to listen to what I have to say. Even a prisoner has a chance to speak before he's sentenced. Oh, you sound like a book and a very cheap one. I did love you more than anything else in the world, and it does hurt. Now, what could you possibly say that would alter that? Do you suppose I came down here if I didn't have something to say? Well, what about your wife? Sandra? Well, Sandra was not properly divorced from our predecessor, Mr. Stokes, when it was thought that we were properly married. And the necessity for a second and sober marriage ceremony was explained to me by my lawyer, Jock Thompson, last Wednesday when I came down here to see you. You didn't tell me that. Well, I wanted to tell you, but I had a clear duty ahead of me. I went back to New York and explained the situation to Sandra. I asked her to marry me when her divorce papers were final. That was yesterday, Tuesday. But she preferred to go to Philadelphia and perform on her piano. So I waited in New York until midnight, and then by every stroke of my conscience, I was free. Oh, oh Peter. And I'm free right now. Maggie, you're not going to turn me down again, are you? Oh, darling. Darling, do I look crazy? Oh, 
Nice music. Oh, yes. Yes, there must be something very special going on around here. Yes, a wedding. Oh, today? Uh-huh. Well, friends of yours? Uh-huh. Pete and Maggie, you remember them. Oh, yes. And naturally, I'm, gl I'm glad the suspense is over. They've been messing about at getting married ever since I can remember. Ah, the fool. Yes. Was it a nice wedding? Oh, the usual thing. Do you, I do, kiss the bride, have some cake. That's you know. a good idea. <laughs> what? Kiss the bride. Oh, darling. I can hear your heart beating. Oh, don't be silly. That's my watch. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, uh, it's getting late. I really should be on my way. Oh, dear, so should I. I'm on my honeymoon, you know. So you are, mm -hmm. having a lovely time. Oh, darling. lovely so far. Darling, we have been such fools. Think of all the time we've lost. All those precious hours we could have been together. We've just thrown those hours away, Pete. Yeah, four years of them. Well, don't let's think of them now. Hold me, darling. And make me forget there was ever a moment when I wasn't close to you. Down bodily. Bodily, my love, bodily. Oh, right. You asked for it. <laughs> Miss Maggie, there's a letter here. What, Violet? The letter just comes, special delivery. Let me see. Oh, that's from Washington. Washington? What uh -huh. do they want? Oh, it's probably something about... Oh, Violet. You got some bad news, Miss Maggie? No, not exactly, but... Mr. Pete has to go to Washington at once. And you just married five days? Why, well, just let that letter blow away in the wind. <laughs> you think I could get away with it? Maggie. In here, Pete. Now, Violet, don't you say anything yet. No, I ain't saying a word, not me. Well, what's going on up here anyway? Come on. Oh, that letter for me? No, no, it's for me. It's from Uncle Ted. Oh, how is he? All right, I guess. Doesn't you say? Well, I haven't read it all yet. Come on, Pete, let's go for that ride, shall minute. we? Wait a minute, wait a minute. What's the matter with you? Nothing. Oh, yes, there is. Anything in that letter? No. Let me see it. No, Pete, oh, I... Yes, well, come on, I'll give it to me. Oh, I'll Pete, take it away. Pete, I'll Give no. me that. Give... Oh, all right. Come on, come on, come on. All right, I'd have had to tell you anyway. It's from Washington. They want you to leave right away. Really? Mm -hmm. Let's see it. Well, Uncle Ted says, if Peter is really serious, I advise that he lose no time in coming here. And then he goes on to say that Aunt Ada's in New York now and that... Pete, I have a wonderful idea. You fly to Washington. I'll go on to New York and stay with Aunt Ada. You see your man in Washington, and then come on up to New York, and we'll have a spree. What do you say? Well, that's great. <laughs> but you were going to lie to me, weren't you? Yes. Mm hmm You were going to hold out on me. Oh, darling, I know you've got to go, but I hate it. Now, now, we made a bargain, didn't we? I know, I know we did, but I'm going to miss you so, darling. Oh, Maggie, you smell of hay and horses and sunshine. Gee, what lovely kids you're going to have. Oh, darling... Hello, operator. This is Mrs. Van Allen speaking. If that long-distance call comes through for me, I'm in the Palm Lounge. Hello, Maggie. Oh, hello, Sandra. Yes, operator, I I'll be here for some time. Thank you. I didn't know you were in New York, Maggie. I want to congratulate you. Thanks. Where's Pete? In Washington. Oh, so you did get him into the air. Yes, I did. Maggie, I'm giving you fair warning. I'm going to get Pete back. Well, Pete's married to me now, Sandra. Yes, and there wasn't any flaw in that ceremony, was there? You'd see to that, wouldn't you? Look, do we have to go on with this? I've canceled my tour, Maggie. Really? Yes. You see, I'm going to have a baby. Pete? Yes. Oh, but you wouldn't. You couldn't. You're wrong, Maggie. I can and I will. This is Van Allen. Yes, what is it? It's your long distance, man. Oh, thank you. Hello? Hello, darling. I'm talking to you from your Uncle Ted's house. Hello, darling. Hold on, will you? I'll go upstairs. No, there isn't time, Maggie. I'm leaving on a trip immediately. I immediately? But where are you going? I don't know. They haven't told me yet. Oh, well, for how long, dear? Darling, I don't even know that. A couple of months, at least. Oh, Pete. Well, that's awfully quick notice, I know. Well, uh, will you be flying? Of course. That's what I'm here for. Oh, yes, I... Well, the, darling, then I won't see you before you leave. Well, I'll write you as soon as I can. Goodbye, darling. Tell him I'm with you. I said goodbye. Goodbye, dear. Take good care of yourself. You too. Oh, yes, yes, of course, dear. 
Goodbye. Goodbye, sweet. Is Pete going away? Yes. Too bad. You're going to lose him, Maggie. I'm going to get him back. Well, time will take care of that. I told you I'm going to have a child. You're lying. Am I? Time will take care of that. Mr. DeMille presents Act Two of The Great Lie, starring Loretta Young, George Brent, and Mary Astor, in just a moment. Now, if Sally and I may take a few liberties with an old saying. Of all sad words, there's one that's shocking to girls today. A run in my stocking. Yes. Stocking runs are real tragedies today. With a couple of bold, bad villains to blame for many of them. Harsh, alkaline soaps. Cake soap rubbing. These are two villains that are to blame for many costly, heartbreaking stocking runs. Two villains that rob stockings of their elasticity, that weaken the threads so they break easily into runs. But they're two villains that haven't a chance to ruin your stockings if you stick to new, quick luck. Lux is very gentle. It guards that vital quality of elasticity because it contains no harmful alkali to injure delicate stocking threads. And, of course, with Lux, there's no cake soap rubbing to weaken them either. Nightly Luxing takes away soil and perspiration quickly, thoroughly, and safely. So you get better wear from your precious stockings. Over 90% of the makers of stockings advise Lux Flakes, makers of rayon, cotton, and wool stockings, as well as of silk and nylon. Keep those two villains... Harsh soaps and cake soap rubbing away from your stockings. Save your stockings with gentle Lux care every night. It's easy and very thrifty. One big box of Lux Flakes does stockings every night for months. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of The Great Lie, starring Loretta Young as Maggie, George Brent as Pete, and Mary Astor as Sandra. <laughs> For weeks, nothing has been heard of Pete, until at last, to an office in Washington, comes a confidential message. Confidential, not to be released. Peter Van Allen plane forced down. Search party leaving for interior tonight. Twenty-four hours later, Maggie has still not heard the news. Now in her aunt's apartment in Washington, she meets a man from the War Department. Come in, Maggie. This is Colonel Harrison. Not the Colonel Harrison. How do you do? How do you do, Mrs. Van Allen? Aunt Ada's told me so much about you. Sit down, won't you, please? Maggie. Yes? Colonel Harrison has news about Pete. Oh, really? Is he coming back soon? Mrs. Van Allen, I, I'm afraid it's not very good news. Why? What do you mean? It's not altogether hopeless yet, but your husband and his party have been missing for 24 hours over the Brazilian jungle. Missing? Well, you see, the terrain is very difficult. It takes time to get a search party and their planes back over there. None of them have been able to make a landing yet. So far as we know, the only point they could land is 40 miles from where they last heard from the plane. The country's very thick. It may take a little time. Pete. It's not hopeless, Maggie. Colonel. Colonel, you'll let me know, won't you, right away? Of course. I mean, even if it's bad news, you'll tell me. Please. We'll let you know as soon as we do. But you mustn't give up hope, Mrs. Van Allen. Not yet, anyway. But it, it... It doesn't look good, does it? I mean, even right now. Frankly, it looks very bad. Oh, thank you, Colonel. Last search party returned tonight. No sign of plane or fires. Search abandoned. That's Miss Maggie ringing. You go up, Jefferson. I just can't look at her face no more. I just can't. I'll go. Who is that gentleman up there? That gentleman's from New York. That's Miss Peter's lawyer. Go along now, Jefferson. Don't keep her waiting. But it's so hard to believe. It's so hard to understand, Jack. I know, Maggie. But you've got to think of yourself. Sleep and food oh, and... Oh, what for? I don't care. You know, all those weeks he was missing, I... I kept hearing him come across in that silly little plane of his. I really heard him this morning. Maggie. Oh, of course, it was only Jefferson with his lawnmower. <laughs> I 
There was no one else like Pete in the whole world. Remember those silly little sketches and that, that crazy old whistle? And... Oh, but you knew him very well, didn't you, Jack? Oh, yes. yes. School, college. I knew Pete. <laughs> oh, Jack, I'll have to forgive me. I... Of course. Yes? Oh, yes, Jefferson. I, I wanted to tell you that Mr. Thompson is staying for lunch. Yeah, I'll soon. And Jefferson, don't you and Violet go around looking like that. Mr. Peter's just gone, that's all. Just gone. Yeah, I'll soon. <laughs> Poor Jefferson. He and Violet loved Pete very much. And Pete... Everyone did, Maggie. There must be some satisfaction in knowing Pete was doing something worthwhile. I know. I've thought of that. But don't you see, I made him do it, Jack. I... He was a very happy man, Maggie. And he wanted to go on that trip. He called me from Washington the day he left. <laughs> he called himself the big family man. <laughs> he wanted children. That would have been something, wouldn't it? What? Something of his to live on. Pete's child. Oh, yes. If I could only scream or something, I'd... Maggie! Don't... Yes? Is Miss Kovac in, please? I'm Mrs. Van Allen. Oh, no, she isn't. I've been calling on the phone since yesterday. May I wait, please? I'm afraid it won't do any good. You mean she won't see me, is that it? Who is it, Bertha? Oh. I'd like to speak to you, Sandra. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Kovac. It's all right. Come in, Maggie. I haven't been seeing anybody these last few days. Sit down. Sandra, were you lying when you told me you might be going to have a child? Pete's child. Oh, does that matter now? If it's true, it does. Sandra, do you remember telling me in Philadelphia that if I wished to leave Pete a letter and marked it personal, he'd receive it unopened? Well, here's a letter from you to Pete marked personal, and it is unopened. In that letter, you told him you were going to have a child, didn't you? Yes, I did. Sandra, be honest with yourself. You only wanted that child when you thought you could get Pete back. Well, now Pete's dead. Sandra, I came here to ask you for that child. What? I was married to Pete. I could give him Pete's name. I could give him everything that Pete could have given him had he lived. Get out of here. Get out. Oh, I know you hate me. Why shouldn't you? We both love the same man. So you do believe I loved him? Oh, yes. I believe that was the one decent thing about you, Sandra. Your feeling for Pete. I can't think of him as gone. He loved life so much. He left us two things in this world. I have his money and you might have his child. You're extravagant. You're a woman of the world, a public figure. Your piano and your success, they won't go on forever. And after all, none of us gets younger. Let me insure your future and you insure mine. Your future? His child. That could be my future. And I'd make you secure financially. Money? Yes. Oh, it's... It's so completely mad. I think, Sandra. Oh, no, think. I couldn't do it now. It's, it's different. I'd be alone. I'd, I'd be afraid. Oh, but you needn't be. I won't leave you for an instant. You? Sandra, let's call a truce. Oh, what? A truce until it's over. Now, you haven't told anyone else. Oh, no, of course not. We'll go away together secretly, out to Arizona. You can have your baby there. No one will know. Sandra, they'll never know. <laughs> Maggie, is that you? Hello, Sandra. Where have you been all this time? Well, I drove into Yuma for a few things. You have to stay all day? That's well, a hundred miles round trip. Here's some things for you. Cologne, talc, bath salt. It's lilac I couldn't get got in that big box. Oh, things we'll need later. What things? Stuff the doctor ordered. Uh, did you bring my sleeping tablets? No. Forget them? No. But well, why? I asked the doctor. What did he say? He said no. Well, you couldn't have told him how badly I was sleeping. Well, I told him how badly I was, and he demanded me. But I had to keep my eyes on you. You're an expert at that. Where are the mess? What for? I want a cigarette. Sandra, how many is that you smoked today? My third since lunch. Well, there are only seven left, and this pack holds plenty. All right, all right, all right. I smoked 12 cigarettes since lunch, and if you really want to know, I had six this morning. I knew that. Spying on me. Well, I have to. Why? 
Because, Sandra, you're such a liar. Well, you smoke your head off. Oh, sure, but that's me. I'm not special. Come on now, why don't we take a walk? Oh, it's too cold. Well, you wear your fur coat. That's a good idea. I'll wear my new mink cape. There might be a photographer from fashion waiting to snap me as I step over a cactus. It's your place, Sandra. Oh, I'm sick of cards. Listen to that wind. Sandra. This will probably turn into a cyclone. One of those tornadoes you read about in the newspapers and blow us all away. Come on, Sandra. We've got time for one more game. <coughs> Can't you do something about that lamp? It's choking me. It's a pity you couldn't have found a place with electric light. Well, I could have, but I'd also have found newspaper reporters. If you want privacy, you have to pay for it. I want another cigarette. All right. Why don't you tell me I've smoked enough tonight? Well, it'll take your mind off the weather. Go ahead. That's right. Be patient with me. I'm a spoiled child, an imbecile to be humored. Maggie the martyr, you make me sick. Come on, Sandra, let's play. I've had enough of this. I'm fed up with the whole business. I'm going to get out of here. Sandra, no. Let me go. You can't keep me here. I won't stay. Don't let yourself go like this. Sandra's not good for I'm you. I'm going outside and start that car and get out of here. Sandra, be careful of that lamp. You'll set the house on fire. Oh, I will. That'll be fine. That'll settle everything. Sandra, come here. Let me go. You burned me. You burned my hand. <laughs> stop it. You <laughs> have to stop you. <laughs> That's better. I'm, I'm sorry, Sandra. Uh, come on now. Let's go on with the game, huh? Well, Doctor? Any minute now. Got that water? Yes, it's all ready. Is Sandra all right? She'll come through this fine. She's as healthy as a horse, that woman. <sighs> you seem more worried about this baby than she is. I... I think I am. Ever have a child of your own? No. Hmm, a pity. Just the sort of woman who should have them. Oh, well, you'll have plenty of time. I suppose so. Hmm. It spells life with capital letters. A woman without a child is like a man without an arm, the right arm. Tragic, the father dying before the child's born. Did you know the father? Yes. No. Oh, uh, what sort of man was he? Oh, he was very handsome. Very clever and very gay. Doctor! Doctor! Well, this is it. There he is, safe and sound. A fine boy, Miss Maggie. Oh, Pete. Pete, my beloved. Got his lunch ready, Violet? Oh, yes, I'm all ready, Miss Meg. And don't he know it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've had a long conversation about that. Violet, I was thinking. Yes. Mr. Pete went to college at Yale. I suppose he'd like young Pete to go there, too. Oh, yes, Miss Meg. Mm. But shall I go up and pack his things now? Within in the morning be soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> he sure gonna look mighty funny up at that <laughs> Yale college without no teeth. <laughs> Miss Maggie. Yes? Your Ada's automobile just come through the gate. Aunt Ada? Oh, I didn't know she was coming. Here, you better feed him, Violet. Yes, sir. Come on, young Pete. Jefferson, there's a the telephone. Answer it. Yeah, yeah, sir. I'll come and telephone. Maggie, where are you? Aunt Ada, I'm in here. Well, where did you spring from? Washington. I came like the wind. How are you, Maggie? I never felt better. Maggie, I want to talk to you. Well, what's the matter? I hardly know how to begin. Well, darling, you're trembling. What is it? Miss Maggie. Yes, Jefferson. You want it on the telephone. There's a telegram. All right. Come on out here, Aunt Ada. Listen. That's what I wanted to see you about. Aunt Ada, wait, will you? Maggie. Hello? Yes, this is Mrs. Van Allen. From where? Find Pete. Maggie, your Uncle Ted was down in a place called Manea. Darling, please. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. Could not wait. Telephone connection. Yes. On my way. Your uncle telephoned me early this morning. He Aunt said Ada, that... I can't hear. Go ahead. Yes, arrived Cartersville about 10 Thursday. Love, Pete. Thank you. Arrived Cartersville about 10 Thursday. 
Pete and another man have been found. Why didn't you tell me? When did you first hear this? Well, Colonel Harrison came down to your uncle and said... I arrived that... Cartersville about 10 Thursday. Why, that's today. It's today. There he is. That's Mr. Pete. Coming down from the sky like an angel of the Lord. Jefferson, you go right in and call that airplane coach. Tell Miss Maggie he's coming straight here. Hurry up! Father, where's Mr. Pete? He's in the baby's room, Miss Maggie. All right. Watch out, the baby's sleeping. Yes. Pete. Maggie. Oh, darling. Darling, I, I... I went to the airport. No, I came right here. I, I couldn't wait. Oh, Pete. Did... Did you see him? Yes, I've just been getting acquainted. Mm -hmm. Oh, he, he's asleep. I... I wanted you to see him when he was awake. What's his name, Maggie? We, we, we call him Young Pete. Do you like him? Oh, he's lovely. Darling, you look ill. Oh, no. I'm all right. Are you really? Of course. Oh, do you think I've changed? Oh, oh yes. The gray hair. A sober, solid citizen, remember? Yes. Maggie, you haven't changed at all. Haven't I? Oh, oh darling, nothing was the same without you, Pete Nathan. You know, this, this young fellow here, he's, he's like me. Yes, he is. How old is he? Well, he's three months and four days exactly. Our son. He, he was all I had of you, Pete. He, except so often I had the feeling you were here laughing at me and chasing me and, and running around in that silly little plane. I'm really here now, darling. Yes. Here with you and our son. You know, I always said you'd have beautiful children. D darling, I... Yes, Maggie. What's the matter? No, Nothing. You're home. That's all I want to think about, darling. You've come home. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille will bring us Act Three of The Great Lie, starring Loretta Young, George Brent, and Mary Astor. In our mail the other morning came an interesting letter from a lady in Spokane, Washington. It's my first fan letter, she writes, and it's a very nice letter indeed. A gracious thank you for the Lux Radio Theater and for Lux Flakes. She tells us this story. One day, a neighbor dropped in while she was getting ready to wash the lunch dishes. Now, don't stop your work, my dear. Let me help. Oh, an offer like that's too good to refuse. Here's a dish towel. Goodness, Ruth. Do you use Lux for the dishes? Wish I could afford to. Afford to? Don't you know how thrifty Lux is? Look how those suds bubble up. And I only use a few flakes. There's nothing kinder to your hands than Lux, I know. And a little goes so far. Why, I use Lux for most of my washing as well as the dishes. And this box has lasted a long time, too. Hmm. Well... Maybe I'll try it out myself. The letter continues. The other day I was at my neighbor's house when she gave her grocery order. At the top of her list was Lux Flakes. Most women do know how gentle and pure Lux Flakes are. Perhaps some of you don't realize how economical it is to use new quick Lux for the dishes. You know, it's the suds that count. And Lux gives more suds, ounce for ounce, than any of ten other leading soaps tested. Now that's true even in hard water. Why not save your hands from that unattractive dishpan look when it costs so little? Tests have proved that red, rough hands begin to grow lovelier in from two to seven days after changing from harsh soaps to gentle, new, quick Lux. Just try it. You'll never want to do dishes any other way. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. Act three of The Great Lie, starring Loretta Young, George Brent, and Mary Astor. Several months have gone by, and Pete still doesn't know that Sandra is the mother of his young son. 
Now Pete and Maggie are in New York in a hotel dining room with Colonel Harriston. Pete, the proud father, has just brought out the latest snapshots of the baby. I have dozens of these, Colonel, and if you really enjoy looking at them, I could send you about 50 to Washington. <laughs> He'll send you 150 if you want. <laughs> <laughs> a fine boy, Pete. Fine. Pete, darling. Sandra, well, hello. Oh, it's good to see you. Hello, Maggie. Well, what does one say to a ghost? Well, just hello, <laughs> I guess. I couldn't believe it when I heard you were alive. It was in Australia just before a concert. I drank a bottle of champagne and played Chopin's funeral march in swing time. <laughs> Have a drink? No, thanks. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Colonel Harrison, Miss Covey. How do you do? How do you do? Staying in town long? No, we're going home tomorrow. Oh, running away so soon? Well, we've been here a week, and I miss the country. Uh-huh, that's what she says, but don't believe her. She's going back to her boy. Oh, I, uh, I've got something to show you. Yes, yeah, Sandra? Oh, pictures. That's the son and heir. What do you think of it? Why, he's so big. He's 31 inches tall, weighs 29 pounds, has eight teeth, and he bites. Oh, he's lovely. And here, here's one taken with his mother. I think he looks like Maggie, but she will have it that he looks like me. He is like you. Don't you think so, Maggie? Yes, I do. Oh, but he has Maggie's smile. Perhaps. I don't know much about babies. Maggie, that must have been quite a moment when you told Pete about the baby. I'd like to have been there. Pete, we'd better run. We're catching an early train tomorrow. You have to go so soon. Well, anyway, it was wonderful to see you, Pete, and I think your son is grand. Only Maggie could have a baby like that. <laughs> of course. I think he'd be a perfect baby no matter who his mother was. Good night, Sandra. Good night. Well, Miss Maggie, there's a lady here to see you. I know. Where is she, Violet? Inside there in the living room. Go tell Mr. Pete, please. Yes. Hello, Maggie. Well, here I am. Yes, I was expecting you. Going to ask me to stay? No. You'd better... What do you want, Sandra? <laughs> Can't even guess, can you? Oh, Maggie, you're marvelous. Well, hello, Sandra. Pete, hello, darling. How are you? Well, what are you doing in this part of the world? Well, I hardly know myself. I was motoring to White Sulphur Springs. All of a sudden, I realized I'd gone straight through to Maryland. Uh -huh. I remembered you lived in Maryland, and here I am. I hope I'm not intruding. Why, of course not. You're looking fine, Sandra. I feel well, a little tired. Oh, I love this place. Oh, I'm going to show it to you. I was wondering, could you put me up for the night? I was going to White Sulphur for a rest anyway. I've had a tough season. Why, yes, I suppose we could. Couldn't we, Maggie? But why, yes. Oh, that'd be lovely, thanks. By the way, where's the baby? I can hardly wait to see him. It was a boy, wasn't it? Yes. Would, would you like a drink, Sandra? Not now, thanks. I'm dying to see the baby. Oh, come on, then. It's upstairs. Oh, Pete, it's time for his bath. Oh, and I, I know. Well, can't I see him in his bath? Certainly. Come on. Isn't the proud mama coming? Come on, Maggie. Uh, no, not now. I want to speak to Violet about dinner. You run along. I'll, I'll join you later. Maggie, it's almost 7 o'clock. I'm coming. You'll be right down, Sandra. What's the matter? Headache? Didn't say anything about it. Here she is. Hello, Maggie. Sorry, I'm late. Cocktail, dear. We're way ahead of you. We've had three. Three? Oh, Maggie, that wifely tone. Do you count his cigarettes, too? Doctor's orders. Doctor's orders. How familiar that sounds. Would you believe it? Once I was under doctor's orders. You? Yes, I had to count my cigarettes, my drinks, and my calories. And what's more, I had a little dragon watching over me every minute to see that I did it. <laughs> Didn't seem to do you any harm. No, I've never seen you look better. <laughs> Come on, have another one. Oh, I shouldn't. But how I love to do things I shouldn't. To my hostess, Maggie, my dear, may you always be as happy as you are now. Thank you. Dinner served, Miss Maggie. Good. Come on, Sandra. Dinner. Oh, the air down here has really given me an appetite. You, know, you always were a great traveler, Sandra. You'd love Australia, Pete. It's a great man's country. Earthy and exciting. Reminds me of our own West. You know, Arizona. Arizona? Why, that's where young Pete was born. Oh, really, Maggie? Yes, on a little ranch. Not here in the ancestral home? No. Well, that's when I was missing. Pretty grim for Maggie. No wonder she wanted to get away from people. Miss Pete? Yes? You want it on the telephone, sir. Long distance. Oh, excuse me. Jefferson, we'll have our coffee in the drawing room. Yes, sir. I'll take my brandy with me, if you don't mind. Oh, I love this room, Maggie. It's very like you. Quiet and peaceful. Sandra, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Nothing. You going to hold me to my bargain? Why, yes. When I made it, I didn't know Pete was alive. When you thought he was dead, you didn't want that baby. 
Now that he's alive, you want them both. It was never a part of the bargain that Pete should be alive. The money you gave me is in trust. It's never been touched. You're not going to tell Pete. No, Maggie. I'm not going to tell him. You're going to tell him. And I'm going to stay here until you do. Well, that's that. Harrison, that's a new planes he wants me to see. Pete, I think I'm going to say good night. I won't have any coffee. It might keep me awake. And I want a good night's sleep. Sleep? Boy, you're not turning in now. Oh, Maggie looks a little tired. Are you, Maggie? Well, but it's so early. Oh, I won't go to bed right away. I'll read and write some letters. Besides, you've got luncheon guests tomorrow, haven't you? Yes. Well, then I think you've had quite enough for one evening. Good night and try and get some rest. Good night, Sandra. I'll come up with you. Oh, don't bother, Maggie. I can find my way. Good night. Good night. Coffee, dear? What's going on between you two? Nothing. Well, something must have happened. Did Sandra say anything to upset you? No, she didn't. Well, then, my darling, don't you think you've let me down a little? How? Well, I don't know why Sandra came here, but I'm sure she came here for some reason, and I particularly wanted to see how happy we are. We are happy, aren't we? Oh, of course, darling. Well, then don't you think you might have taken some other way of showing it? You hardly ate and you hardly spoke. Anyone would think that I beat you in private. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, Maggie, there's something between us tonight. I, I don't know what it is, but it, it's like flying in a fog. I, I can't seem to get my bearings, and I don't like it. We've always told each other everything, haven't we? Yes. That's been the great thing. No secrets. Always honest with each other, haven't we? Yes. Well, then, don't you think you can tell me what's making you unhappy? Maggie, I think I know what it is. It's Sandra. Her being here has upset you, hasn't it? And you think that, well, that I still find her attractive, don't you? Do you? I'd be lying if I told you anything else. Any man would find Sandra attractive. Perhaps even a little exciting. But don't you see, Maggie, I'm not just any man now. I'm your husband. The father of young Pete, and believe me, that makes a whale of a difference. You and young Pete. You'd have to be a man to know what that means, but it's the tops. Are you awake, Miss Maggie? Yes. What time is it, Violet? I didn't get to sleep till early this morning. Why, it's ten o'clock. Oh, that wretched lunch. What am I going to do? Well, the first thing you're going to do is drink your coffee. There ain't nobody coming for almost an hour. I don't want anything to go wrong, Violet. Is, is Madame Kovac up yet? Lordy, yes, and she was up with the birds. Had breakfast and then come to the nursery and took the baby. Took the baby? Where? Where did she take him? Miss Maggie, what's the matter with you this morning? You as white as a tablecloth. Why, she just took him for a little walk. they downstairs at night. Oh. Oh, well, get my clothes, Violet. I'm getting up right away. <laughs> morning, Maggie. Hello, Good morning. Sleepyhead. Hello, I'm sorry I slept so late. <laughs> I'm getting acquainted with this young man. He's a darling. <laughs> yes, isn't he? I'm thinking of stealing him. <laughs> You'd better not try it. Come on, Sonny. Back to the nursery for you. Sit down, Sandra. I want to speak to you. Yes. I think we ought to have a talk, Maggie. I've changed my mind since last night. If you think I can stand by and let Pete think that child is yours and say nothing, you're crazy. Why didn't you tell him the truth when he came back? Why did you lie to him? I didn't lie to him. But Pete thinks that child is yours? He is. What? I didn't lie to Pete. That child is mine. Your part was finished the minute you gave that baby to me. From that day on, I've had only one purpose in my life. To make that baby mine and to forget that you ever existed. So you told Pete the baby was yours. What did you think I'd do about that? I don't know what I thought. I thought that you'd never come back, that perhaps you'd marry and stay away, or, or perhaps you'd die. I hoped you would die. But I didn't die, and I haven't stayed away, and I want that child. Sandra, you walked away from that baby without one backward look. But I've seen him now. But you could have at any time. We made no rule about that. I was in Australia. Oh, it takes more than an ocean to keep a mother from a child she really wants to see. In all those months, you never wrote me one line asking about him. You were perfectly satisfied to take him off your hands... To send him with me. Why, if that had been my child, I'd never have given up. But he's not your child, and you're going to give him up. You could justify that lie to yourself, but you can't justify it to Pete. He'll never forgive you, Maggie. Sandra, you're not going to tell Pete, are you? You see, you're afraid. You don't dare tell him how you've lied to him. And I'll tell you something else you're afraid of. You're afraid you'll lose Pete, too, and you will. He never loved you as much as he loved me. You were second choice. You caught him on the rebound. There's only one thing holding him to you, Maggie, and that's my baby. I'd be too proud to hold a man with another woman's child. 
Pete, come here. What's the matter? Come here. Anything wrong? <laughs> what are you looking so solemn about? I've got something to tell you. Well? I've lied to you about young Pete. What do you mean? I mean, he isn't mine. What are you talking about? He belongs to Sandra. Sandra's his mother. He's mine, Pete. Yours and mine. I'll... I'll tell you as simply as I can. When you were in South America, before you were missing, Sandra told me that she was going to have a child. Your child. And then when you didn't come back and we thought you were dead, well, it, it wasn't an easy situation for Sandra to face alone. So I went away with her and stayed until young Pete was born. And then I persuaded her to let me take him. It was the only way he could have the place that he was entitled to. After all, he was your son. So Sandra gave him to me so that he could have that place. Wait a minute. That's why you went to Arizona alone. That's why you didn't take Violet or Aunt Ada with you. Yes. Yes, I thought there was something funny. You were always so... so shy about taking credit for young Pete. And I remember you saying, no matter who the mother is, the baby would be perfect. At the time, I thought that was very sweet. I, I liked it. I thought it rather touching myself. And you, Sandra. Ever since you've been in this house, you've been hammering sarcastically at Maggie about that baby. The proud mother business. I thought there was something. But, Pete, don't you see? Yes, I... I see. You told everyone the baby was yours. You lied to everyone. When I came back, you even lied to me. How long did you intend to go on lying, Maggie? I couldn't bear the thought of losing either well, of you. Why are you telling me now? Because now Sandra wants the baby. Oh. You mean you're going to take the baby away? He's mine, Pete. When I gave him up, I didn't know you were still alive. It's different now. Well, how is it different now? Sandra just told me that I was only holding you because of young Pete, her child. And that if you knew I'd lied to you, you'd... Well, you'd leave me. Well, Sandra, the baby is yours. If you want to take him, there isn't very much we can do about it. He's a wonderful kid, and we'll, we'll miss him, naturally. But, Maggie, thank heaven we've got each other. Oh, darling. Well, this is another side of you, Pete. The noble, forgiving husband side. You're very pathetic, darling, and just a wee bit nauseating. Sandra, wait. Young Pete's not ready. I I have to get him dressed, and, and could you give me just a little while to say goodbye to him? I... Don't be a fool, Maggie. What would I do with a baby without a man around to bring him up? Pete... You're not forgiving me, I know that. You hate me, don't you? You can tell the truth now. She's gone. You hate me. <laughs> mommy, mommy. He's coming, young Pete. Don't you worry. Oh, Pete, please say something. Don't just stand there looking at me like that. Say what you're thinking. We'd better go upstairs, darling. I think young Pete wants to see his mother. Oh, darling. Mommy, mommy. Come on, Maggie. Yes, darling. Mommy's coming. Just a moment, Mr. DeMille will bring our stars back to the microphone for their curtain calls. Now, here's our fashion reporter, Libby Collins, with a prescription for a spring tonic. This one's fun to take, too. And for just a few dollars, it makes you feel like a million. Here's what you do. Take one spring suit. Doesn't have to be a new one. Add a collection of bright new blouses, and there you are. Take one blouse printed in splashy red roses with a soft bow at the neckline. One tailored blue and white checked chambray with white piquet collar and cuffs. And a plain bright red or stark black to change off, and you've got a grand variety. There are lovely new blouses in the stores. And, of course, if you want to buy the fabric and make your own, they're even less expensive. Add a dash of new quick Lux to your prescription, Libby, and it's even thriftier. Because Lux is so safe for those bright prints and deep colors. Safe for anything safe in water. Lux Care keeps colors fresh and unfaded and new-looking longer. So your pretty things wear better. And better wear is more important to us today than ever. Yes, it's thrifty as well as easy to save our pretty washables with gentle Lux Care. It's care that experts advise. More makers of fine washables advise Lux Flakes than advise all other soaps combined. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. When three stars have taken as many curtain calls in the Lux Radio Theater 
as Loretta Young, George Brent, and Mary Astor. It goes without saying that we're delighted to have them take another. Well, thank you, Mr. DeMille. I always look forward to these weeks in the Lux Radio Theater. You three were certainly convincing in The Great Lie. Well, that's the only time I've been called a liar that I enjoyed it, C.P. <laughs> <laughs> Careful, George. Careful, you'll get me in wrong with the ladies. I feel a little embarrassed, Mary, that every time you've been our guest here, we've given you the rather disagreeable part of the other woman. The Northwest Mounted Police in reverse, Mr. DeMille. The lady who never gets her man. <laughs> <laughs> but the lady who did get an Academy Award for her performance in The Great Lie. Mary, we all want to congratulate you on winning that award. And everybody in Hollywood agrees with that, Mary. Thank you both. It's the nicest thing that ever happened to me. Naturally, I'm very proud of the honor. And I think the audience should know that when Mary arrived here for rehearsal the day she won the award, our whole cast broke into spontaneous applause. That was exactly how we felt about it. Say, what's going on here next week, C.P.? A delightful comedy, George. It's Paramount's hit motion picture, The Lady Eve. And our stars will be Barbara Stanwyck and Ray Milland. You'll hear Barbara Stanwyck in the same part she played on the screen, the beautiful card sharp, who finds a victim in Ray Milland until love takes a winning hand in the game. And we're sure to win with fortune dealing us the Lady Eve next Monday night. Well, the picture was a great success, Mr. DeMille. I know you'll have a fine play. Good, Good night. night. Good night. Good night. The great lie is certainly worth telling. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Barbara Stanwyck and Ray Milland in The Lady Eve. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Henry Morgenthau, Jr., Secretary of the Treasury, has honored our sponsor, the makers of Lux Flakes and Lux Toilet Soap, with a citation which reads as follows. For distinguished service rendered in behalf of the National Defense Savings Program, this citation is awarded to Lever Brothers for radio promotion. Needless to say, we are proud that our sponsor's efforts on this program and on all other Lever Brothers programs have won this recognition. You can be sure that Lever Brothers Company will continue to do all in its power to promote the sale of defense bonds and to further every other effort to win the war. The picture, The Great Lie, was directed by Edward Goulding. Loretta Young is currently seen on the screen in the Columbia picture Bedtime Story. George Brent appeared tonight through the courtesy of Warner Brothers Studio and will soon be seen in their production of In This Our Life, in which he co-stars with Betty Davis. Mary Astor's current picture is the Warner Brothers production, The Maltese Falcon. Heard in tonight's play were Ruby Dandridge as Violet, Griff Barnett as Colonel Harrison, Verna Felton as Aunt Ada, Buck Woods as Jefferson, and Charles Seal, Boyd Davis, Arthur Gilmore, Leon Ledoux, and Leo Cleary. Tune in next Monday night to hear Barbara Stanwyck and Ray Milland in The Lady Eve. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Ruick.